the first time we saw the Russian fishing fleet was back in the 1950s. At that time, nobody paid too much attention to them, except for some of the statements they had made that they were going to come over here and catch the fish and put us out of the fishing business, and, which most effectively I think they've done. I view the growth of the Soviet Navy with great concern. It's a highly efficient, modern, thoroughly competent, far-ranging blue water Navy today, at home virtually in any ocean areas of the world. They've learned the lesson that the country that has maritime power controls events. And indeed, the lesson that the British taught them 150 to 200 years ago. And every week brings another new example of how the Soviets are using their fleets to spread their influence. Admiral, with the NCHOP of the Soviet para guided missile cruiser last night after she came through the Bosphorus, the total Soviet units in the MED now total 44. The CARA, of course, has the SSN-10 missile aboard and will be a primary threat. We have a submarine rescue tug on its normal station just off the Shetlands. We have an intelligence collector the present one is the Traverse, uh, resident in the Clyde Approaches. We also have in the southwest... Admiral Sir Terence uh, Lewin, commander-in-chief of all British warships afloat, attends with his staff at Northwood the daily briefings on the worldwide dispositions of the Soviet fleet. The AGI, which is normally on station off Portland, has moved up to the Skagrak, where yesterday it was reported in surveillance of NATO units on exercises. A Cresta-class guided missile cruiser is transiting south across the Bay of Biscay and is probably en route to the Indian Ocean. It has recently come down the channel after working up in the exercise areas in the Baltic following the building at the Zhdanov shipyard at Leningrad. These waters are the highways of all nations. Sea travel is an integral part in the maintenance of modern communities. To protect their rights of sea travel, governments build navies to patrol the open waters. At present, the United States and the Soviet Union dominate sea power. But Russian ships are newer, and experts believe there are differences in design priorities as well. According to Norman Polmar, U.S. editor of Jane's Fighting Ships, the United States' priorities appear to be, first, electronics, second, habitability, third, endurance, fourth, weapons, and finally, propulsion. In sharp contrast with American priorities, the Soviet Union seems to place its emphasis on weapons, followed by propulsion, then electronics, endurance, and at the bottom of the list, habitability. The difference is dramatically underscored when you examine the priorities of the United States Navy during World War II, when the U.S. was trying to build up its Navy quickly. The priorities were exactly the same as Russia's today. I think it's difficult to uh, give an estimate, a very neat comparison of relative strengths in such a way as you would rank football teams, for example. Uh, when we look at numbers of ships, the the Soviet Navy has almost three times as many ships as does the United States Navy. And when we add the Warsaw Pact allies and the NATO allies, that ratio remains about the same. On the other hand, if we compare displacement tonnages, which uh, represents the size of ships, the United States uh, has almost twice the displacement tonnage in our Navy that the Soviets have. Um, perhaps the best measure of 
comparative abilities of the two navies is to ask ourselves the question, can the United States Navy, with its allies, carry out its wartime uh, missions and functions uh, in a NATO Warsaw Pact conflict, or can the uh, uh, Warsaw Pact countries prevent our navies from doing their job? Um, I believe that uh, today, the United States and its NATO allies can carry out their wartime tasks and responsibilities, but it would be a very tough fight. There's no question about it. But uh, I think that we are in a position uh, today where we would prevail. I can't say I'm necessarily that sanguine about the future. One reason for the Soviets' preoccupation with naval strength is possibly their recent weakness at sea a weakness that was exposed to the world in the incredible and frightening events of October 1962. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will they found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. The American fleet sailed from home ports to do just that. Khrushchev, his bluff called and without a fleet to support him, had no choice but to climb down. The missiles were dismantled and returned to Russia and the world breathed again. There is no sure way of knowing, but the outcome of that crisis might have been different had the Kremlin remembered the words of Joseph Stalin, no nation that becomes a world power, said Stalin, does so without a navy. In the early years of this century, the seeds of revolution in Russia were germinating. And because of wretched living conditions, they first bore fruit in the navy. In 1905, a ship in the Black Sea's fleet mutinied. She was the battleship Potemkin. After an officer had shot a seaman, the mutineers killed the captain and several officers, then sailed to Odessa. After this, revolutionary fervor seems to have abated, and for a while longer, the Navy gave its monarch the respect that was his due. For the Tsar and his family, the sands were running out fast. In 1914, war came. There were several operations in support of the army, with troops being landed on the coast of Thrace and Armenia behind enemy lines, and in a number of skirmishes with the Turkish Navy, the Russians sank several ships. In 1917, the revolution. In St. Petersburg, the Navy did its share. The cruiser Aurora helped the Bolsheviks to power by firing at the Winter Palace. The long reign of the Tsars was finally over, and in their place came a man whose name was to become a household word, Lenin. Sailors didn't find conditions under his rule any better than that of the Tsars, and in 1921 they revolted. Bolshevik soldiers attacked them across the ice, and after heavy casualties on both sides, the rebels surrendered. Most were executed. Lenin died, and his place was taken by a man just as famous and much more infamous, Stalin. <laughs> 
When Joseph Stalin took over the reins of Soviet government, the Navy was little more than a few coastal crafts. But Stalin believed in the Navy and began slowly to build it up. First because there was little money with coastal craft, then during the 1930s with big cruisers built to Italian designs. And later he built submarines, more than a hundred so that by 1936, Russia had the biggest submarine fleet in the world. Then in 1937, worried that the regime was losing its grip, Stalin ordered the killing of more than two million of his fellow countrymen, including the commanders-in-chief of the Baltic, Black Sea, and Northern fleets, as well as the great majority of all admirals, captains, and commanders. <laughs> It was a massacre. So that when, in 1941, war with Germany came, the Navy was in no position to take the offensive. The Baltic fleet seldom ventured far from port. Its ships did little more than support the flank of the army and help in the defense of Leningrad. Even the famous Arctic convoys to Murmansk and Archangel that kept Russia supplied with weapons of war were mostly escorted not by Russian, but by British warships. In 1945, Europe's war ended, and even as the world leaders in Potsdam debated how to divide its spoils, another war, what became known as the Cold War, began. Across Europe, in Churchill's words, an iron curtain came down. But when the tyrant Stalin died, he was succeeded by the eccentric Khrushchev. And suddenly, the ice began to thaw. A British squadron was invited to Leningrad for the first time since the war. On board the aircraft carrier Triumph was BBC's David Woodward. It was tremendously thrilling to be going to Kronstadt and Leningrad in the first place. Kronstadt's always been a mystery fort, even in Tsarist times. But when we got there, we stopped thinking about that. We were so surprised by what we actually saw there now. The big harbour was absolutely packed with warships, a battleship, a couple of cruisers, destroyers and submarines, more ships than most of us guessed the Russians had, and this was only one of their ports. We came, we came back to London and, of course, the uh, Naval Intelligence Division asked us around to explain how clever they'd been. And they had been, because they'd been saying all along, the Russians are building a big navy. And people said, no, this is tententious propaganda, uh, it's prov provocation, uh, they're not. But, of course, they were, and we'd seen it. Next year, the Russian cruiser Orzho Nokidzi steamed into Portsmouth, England. On board were Mr. Khrushchev and Marshal Bulganin, B and K as they were jocularly called, and it looked as though Anglo-Russian relations were entering a new and better age. But today the visit is remembered less for B and K than for the legendary story of Commander Crab. Crab, a professional diver, had, it was rumored, been paid by British intelligence to inspect the hull of the Orjano Kitsi, her screws and rudders and anti-submarine equipment. Rumor also says that the Russian defenses were able to cope with him. No one has confirmed or denied it, but that was about the last time Commander Crab was seen alive, and months later his headless body was found floating in Portsmouth Harbor. The visit had been a success, but big cruisers, said Khrushchev, were now only fit to carry elderly statesmen like himself on goodwill visits about the world. Instead, Russia now concentrated on the vessels that would be her best defense against the American strike carrier force, submarines. And now that her trade with the West had begun to expand, she started, for balance of payments reasons, to build up her own merchant fleet something that no great naval power has ever been without. <laughs> <laughs> 
it was a fleet that was to be part and parcel of the Navy. And then Khrushchev appointed as head of the Navy an admiral who is still there today, who has been more responsible than anyone for the rise of the Red Navy, Sergei Gorshkov. Admiral Gorshkov is probably the most remarkable figure in the navies of the world in the 20th century, certainly, maybe in history as a whole, because he started his uh, naval career um, in a perfectly normal way, but reached preeminence in, in the last war, when he, in command of the coastal flotillas, was uh, um, promoted to rear admiral at the age of 32, uh, and this was at a time when he met Khrushchev in the area of operations where he was. He's been extremely successful in uh, influencing his government to provide the necessary resources to the, the Soviet Navy. I think he must be particularly persuasive and skillful because the Soviets have traditionally been a land power. But uh, certainly the, the Russian bear has been exposed to... Uh, a sea breeze and has developed a liking for salt water. Countries with strong navies, said Gorshkov, are rich and powerful. Those without them are doomed to decay. And he prodded the Kremlin into authorizing the building of a new fleet. But first he had to find the men. Most, some 80%, were and still are conscripts, called up for three years military service at the age of 18. Those that liked the life could voluntarily sign on for a further three years, could even graduate to the rank of officer, and some of the best men it was found came from places furthest from the sea. There was political training, too. When they went abroad, they were told they were the representatives of the sober-minded Soviet Union and must conduct themselves accordingly. It was a policy that was handsomely to pay off. Every month, new ships and new crews came into service. They were all part of Gorshkov's twofold plan to nullify American sea power where it threatened Russia and establish Russian sea power where it could threaten America. And secondly, to spread Soviet influence abroad by showing the flag around the world. The Cuban Missile Crisis may likely have been an unforeseeable outcome of this effort, stemming from Khrushchev's overconfidence. It was a humiliating moment for the Kremlin and brought home to them even more forcibly Gorshkov's preachings about sea power. Orders went out to dockyards in the Soviet Union to accelerate construction of existing ships and lay the keels of new ones. In the middle 60s, a new Russian Navy was born. It was to be the most powerful, the most balanced Russia had ever had. Cruisers, destroyers, missile ships, frigates, vessels of almost every kind. included a completely new class of ships, the helicopter cruiser with its fleet of anti-submarine helicopters. Fast attack craft with missiles and torpedoes. Tank landing craft capable of landing up to 15,000 men. The most sophisticated naval missile system yet built. And a fleet of 400 submarines of every description. Foxtrot class, diesel powered, 20,000 miles range deployed worldwide. 
Victor class, nuclear powered, speed 30 knots, submerged. Juliet class, torpedoes and surface to surface missiles. Whiskey long bin, torpedoes and surface to surface missiles. Echo class, 5,000 tons, crew of 100 nuclear powered torpedoes and surface to surface missiles. Hotel class, small range ballistic missiles. Yankee class, 8,000 tons, crew of 120, 16 intermediate range ballistic missiles. fleet train was built too, to accompany the warships on their voyages abroad and make them self-sufficient. Supply ships with stores and ammunitions, oil tankers to fuel the fleet at sea. And the 45,000 ton satellite tracking ship, cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin. And spy ships were built to lurk off Polaris submarine bases Watch and listen, and send reports to Moscow. The British Polaris submarines that leave the Clyde know that the spy ships, and sometimes Russian submarines too, may be waiting for them. And they have their own ways of coping with them. Assume the search quiet state. Sonar tracking stations closed up. And the listeners, in their turn, are listened to. in the last few years has the Soviet Navy made use of its newfound sea power. The Mediterranean was once a NATO lake, first the province of the British Navy together with the French and Italians. Later it became the stamping ground of the American Sixth Fleet with its nuclear armed carrier striking force. When war broke out in the Middle East in 1956, the British felt obliged to try and stop it by landing troops at Suez. And when the Lebanese government called for help in 1958, the Americans felt no less obliged to land Marines to support it. On both occasions, the Russians protested but could do nothing about it. And then in 1964, their ships came out of Russia and into the Mediterranean. south to Egypt, as the British had done in the old days, and came into the port of Alexandria to show solidarity and friendship. To show their strength to convince smiling Egyptians that not only America and Britain, but Russia too, was now a naval power. That in exchange for a base and port facilities, there was much they could do to help them in their running war with the Israelis. <laughs> 
they were as good as their word. In the 1967 war, a missile boat they gave the Egyptians sank the Israeli destroyer Eilat. Elsewhere in the Mediterranean, the Soviet naval buildup went on. The helicopter ship Moskva made its appearance and some of the new 4,000-ton Kashin-class destroyers. By the early 1970s, there were as many Soviet ships in the Mediterranean as Americans. In Arab countries along the North African coast, they were able to establish semi-permanent bases. And in remote anchorages, outside territorial waters, they left buoys with visiting cards on them. Belongings of the USSR. And then, growing bolder, the Russian Navy started what has become known as shouldering tactics passing as close to American and British warships as they dared without actually colliding. Their object, to test Allied nerves and ship handling and gain intelligence at close quarters. But sometimes they miscalculated. In November 1970, the carrier Ark Royal struck a Russian destroyer. The damage to the Ark Royal was slight. To the destroyer that had crossed its bows, it was more serious. Two men were killed and a tarpaulin quickly pulled over the damaged parts. Today, the I spy tactics continue. Here, a Russian destroyer steams close to the U.S. carrier Forrestal. But because of the danger of accidents, the Russians have agreed not to be too provocative. And for the Allied ships, they're little more than a nuisance like being followed by a strange dog you can't quite get rid of. They don't really, well, they can bother you, but they, they don't really bother us. We know that they have a job, and we have our job to do. Uh, for instance, when one crossed my bow, I know he's going to do it. And uh, as he always does, uh, it appears he always does, he chooses to have me in a, in a, a position where uh, he can embarrass me or test me just a little bit, and that's fine. They, they are possibly more aggressive than we are, and I would suggest, if, if I may, that it's because the repercussions are, are a little different if they run into somebody. Uh, they are, it, it's their job to, to nudge us, as it were, and it's not our job to nudge them. But I find that they're, pre they're pretty fair seamen. We carried the Don AS-981 with the Other Soviet ships may be out of sight beyond the horizon, but to the intelligence officers, rarely out of mind. CLGM, a Kotlin DDG, and a tanker at that anchorage. Saying the altitudes, correct? Yes, sir, we've got them all. And deep down below decks, using the most complex instruments, both sides watch and listen to each other all the time. Console 2, Console 1. 2, I. This is issued on the Soviet destroyer, please. Today, the familiar dots and dashes of the Morse code are rarely heard. Now messages go out into the ether in a scrambled, computerized code impossible to break. Day and night, the watch goes on. The Russians, no less than the Americans and British, look and listen, exercising their own systems, gleaning what intelligence they can. They, too, send out computerized messages that sound little different to those of the Americans. 